All right, and we are live. Bolded Slugs going global on this one. Uh, I am Zeus Ryan. Today we are welcomed by David Stokes. David, tell everyone how you're doing. Uh, I'm very well, thank you. It's nice to be here. Good. Uh, I, I imagine it's, uh, what, 3? 3 p.m.? It is. It's 3 p.m. here. What's uh, what's weather like? Uh, uh, dreadful. Ju- dreadful. Is, it's is that- England. We get sun for about 40 minutes in July, and the rest of it is just rain. So um, it's not great. So then why doesn't anybody talk about that the same way they talk about, like, Seattle? Like, it's a, it's, it's a feature, not a bug. Yeah, I, I wouldn't call it a feature. Um, yeah, it's just, I mean, sometimes the weather's amazing, and, you know, in january for some particular reason it's like the weather doesn't really know what it's doing over here it's just whatever it decides to be that day you know you can get thunder sun and snow in one day it's insane uh point of fact uh we here in in iowa middle of the country we we like to brag about how we can have all four seasons in one day yeah Uh, we just got about an inch of snow uh this morning and we will be uh, 60 degrees Fahrenheit, sorry, uh, <laughs> by, by Sunday. And it'll be as if it never happened. Um, yeah, crazy. Uh, global warming at its finest, I can only imagine. Who it's knows? just confusion. All I find is that it's just confusion. Yeah. Just doesn't know what it wants to be. But today it's very gray and very cold. And yeah. Um, so a good reason to be inside, a good reason to talk shop about writing. Absolutely. And uh, I, I have you as ostensibly my first international guest. I've, I, I, I've had people from, from Canada, but those are just our, you know, our neighbors upstairs. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, uh, yeah. What can you describe as kind of like the writing industry in, in the UK? Because I have an understanding of the way things are here in the States. Yeah. And I want to make sure I understand, is it different? Is it similar? Um, is it good? Is it bad? What do you want to change? What do you want to see improve? Yeah. <laughs> um, it's It didn't used to be, but it's pretty similar now. It's like, um, it's a very closed off medium to a lot of writers. Like, if you haven't got a credit, if you haven't got an agent, you're almost certainly not going to get read unless they specifically add for uh, ask for um, unsolicited scripts. Isn't that the truth? Um, <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. So it's like, you know, we've got the BBC and we've got Sky Television and things like that. So things that are based in England, we've got the big things. But um, it's pretty much the same as it is in the States now. It's very, very closed off. It, it involves an incredible amount of luck to get your foot in the door. It's, you know, it used to be, you know, in, in the 90s, 80s, 90s, two, almost into the 2000s, a lot of it relied on talent. Like the, the, the cream always rose to the top. For They're sure. The old scripts. You know, it's why Shane Black was a millionaire by the time he was like 30, because he wrote great scripts and everyone wanted them. If Shane Black started today, he may never sell a script. You know, it's just that's the difference between then and now. Now it's just look. I mean, obviously, talent is involved. You know, no one's going to buy a script that is rubbish. But what ha- have have you seen, Madam Web? Ooh, ooh, sorry, that's a bit of a that's a zinger. I haven't. <laughs> it hasn't come out over here yet. Um, but I did read some of the reviews, and uh, yeah, they're just destroying it. Um, very surprising. Do you have a sense here? We very much operate, uh, at least in the up and coming circles the yet to break through circles very yeah. much on a you know don't poo poo something because that could be you one day so you don't say bad things about no. an objectively not good product is that st- is that still true uh in in your circles is that is that the same or can you be a little bit more 100 percent, it's true um in, in because it's now 2024 and everything is social media and everything is online um there is i mean i'm not saying it's 100 percent certain but there is a very very good chance that people will look through your social media to see what you've said about anything oh uh, that's dangerous because, yeah yeah because they're basically they're making sure that you know we're going to spend this amount of money on this film or on this script and then we're going to spend this much on this film we don't want a tweet from 15 years ago 
going viral because someone's, you know, because the internet has looked through this writer's mm -hmm. social media and gone, oh my God, he said that. Um, so yeah, you may notice from my Twitter, I do complain about politicians, but I will never tweet. I will tweet if I think a film is brilliant. I will never tweet if a film is crap. No, no, not even once. I, I appreciate that rule uh, in theory. Um, in practice, listen, do as do as I say, not as I do. Um, yeah. I just I there's a reason oh, yeah. why the I'm show's called saying... Bolded Slugs, man. I'm not being I'm not necessarily trying to be nice to people, but I feel like we get hamstrung as Yeah, I'm not saying I agree with it. Um, sure, sure. You know, but it's it, it is absolutely a fact. I I mean I think I I got it because I used to, you know, mm. years and years ago, I would go, I've just seen this film, it's awful. And then I saw the thing about um I think Kevin Smith did an interview once and he just and he said what I basically what I've just said, which is, you know, I will praise a great film. I will never talk about a bad one because, you know, 500 people made that film and it's not their fault um, it really, and it's yeah. their livelihoods at stake and things like that. And I went, that's a very good point, actually. So, to, and, you know, to my friends, whoever's got my phone number, they know what films I hate. <laughs> the um, the group chat knows. But yes. All right. That Social makes sense. Media, but Twitter does not No. So I, I I took a look uh you know at your your website and I'm I'm pleased as punch that you have one because it's just it, it gives me an idea of be like oh oh there's another thing that I need to do um, where yes you, you post your work and I see and I, I want to know if this is common in, in your circles that you write through because here there is still very much a stay in your lane pick a genre and 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 make yourself known at that i see a lot of diversity yeah. in your work horror comedy little mix of both straight up drama do you just yeah. like is it just i like telling stories man and that's that's literally it um i bet it's because i've had very little produced i think it's that's um that's why i'm not pigeonholed it's like if i wrote an amazing drama Mm -hmm. And then I tried to sell a comedy. They go, no, you're the drama guy. You know, it's, but right now it's like, I have no boss. I have no one telling me what to do. If I get an idea for a story, be it horror, you know, historical, I've written the World War II movie as well. I wrote it for a director in, in Germany. And it's just, if I were to write it, I'll write it. Um, and yeah, that, that's, don't worry about diversifying. You know, all that matters. It's what I say to people all the time. It's like no one, no one cares, you know, because some people tweet and they've gone, I've written eight scripts this year. Right. And it's like no one cares about eight mediocre scripts. They only care about one great one. Mm -hmm. No one's impressed by how much you write. They're impressed by how long you can work on one script and make it perfect. Um, the converse is almost often true, is you can in cer some circles write too much. Because yeah. it implies that it might not be the greatest. Yeah. Yeah. I, I defy anyone who writes. I mean, there, I'm sure there are exceptions to the rule, but anyone who writes six movies a year and they go, this is fantastic. Now on to the next one. This is fantastic. I, I was like, I can categorically promise you it's not. <laughs> you know, it may have a great idea yeah. and it may have a great premise, but it may not be executed properly and it may not be, you know, edited properly you know it might be 130 pages when it clearly could be 95 it's it's something i see a lot because i read a lot of scripts from amateur writers because it's interesting to see how people write and the main issue i see is they a lot of them lack a filter you know a lot of them will go this scene's eight pages long and i'm not changing a word because it's brilliant and it's just like yeah but you could probably do it in two and get the same point across I, I have heard actors, and and some of us don't have the benefit of a, an actor's perspective. So I I will allow that maybe there are they're they're unaware of these types of things. But I, I I heard somebody say many moons ago that a scene that was two three pages long, the actor was like, I can do this with a look. Yeah, and and yeah, yeah. and you're like, no, there's no possible way. But then they do that and. So do do you feel that people are not getting enough outside perspective 
on their work and they're just like, I wrote it and it's great. And my mom said it was fantastic. And they're just I mean, running with it. <laughs> there is a lot of that. Um, you will find it's weird. You will find guys and, and women that have agents and have kind of, you know, had dealings with the industry. They are far more humble than amateurs who go, I've written a 190 page script and it's amazing. And I'm going to change the industry. It's like, go for it. No one's going to give you money to make it. But if you want to make it yourself, go for it. Yeah, hubris um, isn't cash and checks. <laughs> precisely. It's great you've got confidence in yourself because, my God, you need confidence because your entire life is sitting alone going, is this good? I have no idea. Um, but, yeah, people, you've got to be open to not necessarily criticism, certainly constructive criticism. You know, <laughs> you've got to be open to going, it's good, but have you thought about this? Have you thought about this? And basically, very briefly, what I always do, because it's what I do myself and it's what I want, I always tell other people, when I finish the script and the first draft is undoubtedly too long, um, when I start rewriting it, I will look at every scene in order. And like scene one, I will go, what's the point of this scene? What is this scene telling the audience? And I go, right, how much of this can I take out and still get that point across? You know, and right. I will also go, I will look at the scene and I'll go, if I take this scene completely out of my story, does the film still work? as if nothing's missing from it. And if the story works, it's gone. It's like, just be, you know, it's window dressing. It looks, you know, it might be a character moment. It could mm -hmm. be a conversation. But you go, if you take that out, does this movie read in exactly the same way, except it's now three pages shorter? Yes, gone. It's like, I wrote a, a wrestling movie right before The Wrestler came out, and I was gutted when it was announced. But Does the it, first that was slick, slick Mick, I believe I saw on your uh, sick, sick Mick, sick yeah. Mick. Um, and the first draft was 167 pages, and Ooh. my final draft was 94. Like, that's how much I cut out of it. Talk about not being precious to your darling. No. That's a no, no, yeah. Wow. Like the, op the opening 30 pages in my first draft became like the first seven in the final draft. Because I just quite, you know, because like he arrived at the arena, he talked to someone, he went to a bar, he had a drink, he talked to a woman, he came back, he had the match. You know, he talked after the match. And I went, actually, we just need to see him arrive, see the match. Like, that's kind of it. We know he's a wrestler. Why do I need all the rest of this crap in, in the scene? Do you, I, 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 I've seen this uh, a little bit more lately. I, I know it's true, uh, just anecdotally over the years that you mm. as a writer will get a brilliant idea. Uh, yeah. unprompted, unseen, as if gifted to you by the gods. And you'll <laughs> you'll type fade out, and then you'll turn on the internet and be like, D -d -d famous actor in per script about thing that you literally just finished. And then yes. you just... Uh, I, I, I saw uh, Reacher, the Amazon show. Mm. I, re I realized I had a project that was super similar. Uh, a buddy of mine, the new Fantastic Four was just announced, and... Uh, yesterday or the day before and he yeah. made a joke on twitter about how he had to throw something in the bin because it 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 was way too similar and is that something you run into more often than you would like to maybe find is it a conspiracy against us <laughs> it's happened more in the past um there are three was that yeah there were three instances um I think one was the wrestler. I was about 30 pages into Sick Mick when the wrestler was announced, but I was so in love with the story and the character that I just finished it anyway, because I wanted to. Then I was thinking trying to a few years later, or I can't remember the chronology, but then I was like, I was trying to think of an idea for a horror movie. And I went, Oh, Ouija boards. No one's made a Ouija board movie since the eighties. <laughs> I start writing a Ouija board movie. Um, about, you know, two, a couple who find a Ouija board in the house and use it and the all goes horribly wrong. And literally within a week of starting it, Ouija was announced from Blumhouse, I think it was. Oh, man. Um, and, oh, and that was the other one, the famous one, well, famous for me. I went, I was watching a National Geographic documentary on, from Shark Week 10 years ago, whenever it was. And, I, and you saw the people in the cage. And I said to my wife at the time, I said, wouldn't it be crazy if that cage broke and fell to the bottom of the ocean and they had to get out through sharks? And so I, I called it below. I started writing it. I was 60 pages into it. And then 
47 meters down got announced and it was exactly the same story and that is one i never finished but even, though, even though it killed me because it was such a great idea but i was just like they're literally making the same film I, I you hear uh kind of incidentally about the meetings that people have they go to you know studios production companies and they say oh we have something similar what else do you have and it's kind of like no you don't have something similar you're just you're just saying that because you want to take my idea and make it but then <laughs> as, as, in invariably we see oh no they did in fact do you remember yeah. the days when those ideas didn't stop people from releasing them how many uh, we had Armageddon and Deep Impact coming out at the same time. We had Volcano and Dante's what Dante's Peak coming out at the Dante's same time. Peak. Yeah. Why can't we have six wrestler movies or yeah. shark movies come out at the same time? It was a thing that happened in the nineties where I mean and I mean, you know, the eighties, there were probably like seven stories in the eighties and they just got remade four hundred times. Uh, but they were all great. But yeah, in the nineties, like one studio would announce I'm making a tornado movie. And yeah. then the other studio will go, well, shit, we better whack one into development immediately. So, the you know, they might get half the audience and we might get half the audience. They're not getting it all. We're going to share this audience for this particular thing. But I don't remember the discussion. And, and this is one of the things about now that bothers me. Mm. The discussion back then was, yeah, they may have gotten half of the audience each, yeah. But they still made money on half that audience. Yeah. And then now we need to get all of the audience and then some for one thing. And yeah. then they complain that they haven't made, you know, record four or five billion dollars per movie anymore. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And and it's like, no, we we want we want three, four, or five things, not one eh thing. Yeah, I mean, that's that's the major issue that I'm hoping that at some point it's kind of reaching its peak. Like, people are so sick of Marvel movies now. Mm -hmm. Like, at some point, it's going to go full circle and we're going to go back to how it probably was. Like, enough massive movies are going to fail that they start taking chances on smaller ones. But that's the problem. Like, when Titanic got announced, it was $200 million. Everyone, that's insane. Now, any movie with special effects in it, might be that much money and the you marketing know, budget is going to be twice that and then the return needs to be five times all of it precisely yeah so if you spend 200 million on a budget you've got to make 600 million 700 million before you even break even it's insane you know it's i long for the days of you know because i'm very old and wizened now and i grew up in the early 90s where all the best filmmakers were indie filmmakers Mm -hmm. Like 90 to like 94, 95, cinema was amazing. There was a new guy or woman every six months who made a film that blew your mind. And those people now, if they're in the industry trying to get in now, shy of paying for that movie themselves, it's never going to happen. Or it's certainly, you know, you have to make something like Paranormal Activity, which is like an anomaly. Made for nothing, made hundreds of billions of dollars. I, I uh, had a guest on uh, recently... Uh, who is on the production side of things? Uh, actually, uh, works uh, on on or has worked on one of the Shark Week programs. So uh, this, this is kismet, man. We're all coming together with it. But the, she was saying that she's seeing on her end, and she works in production. So I'm I'm taking this as a little bit more than, um, you know, with a grain of salt. But yeah. the two. Th Kevin Smith said a long time ago that you can't make the $10, $20 million movie anymore. And that was true for a very long period of time. But now there is financing for the 2 to $3 million. It doesn't have to be specifically micro-budget. But the smaller movie, uh, they're calling it contained or you know limited cast, limited locations. Do you yeah. see in... The, the scripts that you that you read, people have kind of gotten that memo or are you still seeing people write massive blockbustery budget be damned films? Yeah, um, I mean, it's, it's a mixture. I've never I haven't read a script in a very long time where you can see they're trying to make it super easy to produce, like with a really low budget. Um, but yeah, I mean, it's if you want to write a movie that is two hours of special effects and sci-fi. You know, 
by all means, it will be a great sample. And if you sell five scripts, someone might be interested in that amazing movie you've written. Right. But if you're coming into the business now or you're just tr starting to like go, oh, I think I'm good enough to kind of make it here or at least give it a go. Absolutely right. The lowest budgeted thing you can possibly make because the lower the budget, the more people are going to be interested in it. Because people, if you can make, if they can make a feature film for a million dollars or $2 million, they're going to be way more interested in that film than if you send them that script and it's going to cost 30. True. Because, yeah, so I would absolutely, I mean, you know, don't ignore the amazing ideas, just write both. Well, and that's, you know. that's part of the reason why I, I, I was encouraged by uh, the, the, the projects that you've listed, that they didn't all seem... Uh, no. going one direction. It seemed very much, oh, I could do a rom-com, I could do a horror thriller, I can do a traditional buddy cop comedy, that kind of thing. Um, th that, to me, gives a lot of hope, especially in a world that is very uncertain now in terms of the limited opportunities, because if it's not big, it's not making money, and if it's, you know... If I don't know. I don't want to go off on too much of a rant about the the the, the opportunities for things because at the end of the day, I'm a middle aged white dude, so yeah. I see enough of my face on screen as it is. <laughs> I'm probably not going to be struggling for that in the near future. But um, I, I'm curious to ask, uh, and this is purely and you know an ignorant uh, Yankee asking uh, a guy in the UK uh, a dumb question, but. When you say to your friends, your family, whatever, I'm a writer, uh, I'm a screenwriter, I'm, a, you know, I'm, I'm an author of some kind. Do you have to defend that and 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 keep your family honor intact from the wolves, <laughs> or, or is it just uh, something that people are like, oh, that's totally cool? I mean, at the beginning, I mean, I, I've, ever since I've been small. I've always been the kid that wrote, even at school. And like my famous, my claim to fame is I wrote a story when I was eight years old that gave my teacher nightmares. Um, that apparently at parents' evening, they told my parents that, yeah, I read your son's story and then I dreamt about it and it terrified me. Um, I was a very disturbed kid. But, <laughs> so I've always been the writer, but I think once I started optioning movies, uh -huh. um, they paid more attention. It's still, have you sold anything? Oh, what have you made? It's still that, but they understand that I've got an agent, you know, I've had movies optioned, I've had films made, shorts, and I've had a feature made many years ago. Um, so they know there's something to it. So they're they're pretty cool. They usually just ask me what I'm up to and what I'm doing. You know, the worst is I've got an idea for you, and it's like keep it to yourself. Oh, you just I yeah, don't need to know it. Nothing nothing like grandma wanting that co producer credit, right? Exactly, yeah. But do, yeah, it happens. Do you find that um, the 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 pipeline, I guess, because um, there's no Hollywood in London. I mean, is 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 London an equivalent? Is 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 there an equivalent Europe? Um, not really, not really. Um, that's you know we've got Pinewood Studios. You know mm -hmm. that's enormous, but it is literally a production facility. It's not they don't make. You know what I mean? They don't finance movies. You make movies there. Right. Um, yeah. So there's, I mean, obviously London is where most of the agents are. Most of the production companies are based, but yeah, it's, it's, it's not like it is in America where, you know, you go to Hollywood, you can, you know, throw a chair at someone and you're going to hit a screenwriter or an actor, you know, that kind of thing. Your it's cup not, of coffee comes with the script that the barista wrote. Yeah, yeah. 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 It is not like that here at all. No. Do you have then, um, I struggle in the United States. I, I'm I'm fifteen hundred miles away from Hollywood, and I feel that that's Mars. Yeah. Do you have a similar feeling of I need to be in Los Angeles, or with the way things have gone, the one byproduct of COVID being that things are remote now, that you yeah. have a little bit more access and opportunity than previous, or is it still you're nothing if you don't? If you don't hit, you know, you got to come and beat feet in Hollywood. Yeah, I think, I mean, there's a couple of ways of looking at it, really. I think if you're an amateur screenwriter and you're going to sell your house and move to California, like, don't. You know what I mean? It's like if you've got a bit, if you've got your foot in the door and you are getting meetings and you are getting things optioned, you know, living near Hollywood or in Hollywood 
it might be beneficial because your agent might go, yeah, you've got to go in at three o'clock this afternoon and right. talk to someone. The water bottle but, tour is is a real thing. Yeah, I get it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So it's like, so for me, I mean, my dream was always to live in Los Angeles. And after like the last four or five years in America, it's just like possibly the last place on earth I would ever live because it's just insane. Over. <laughs> I always think England's crazy. And then you turn on the news, you go, no, England's quite normal. Um, it never used to be. I, so. I, I've never been the most patriotic or the most yeah. raw, raw, the United States. Um, and really within the last 15 years, I'm kind of like, Hey, what's Iceland up to? I know they got a volcano, but exactly. I can handle, I can handle a volcano. Yeah. I don't get me wrong. I love America. I love so many things about America. Um, but yeah, I mean, just going back to the question, it's with, because I've got an agent, I can send her things and go, send it to this person. For sure. You know, I don't need to knock on doors and I don't need to send unsolicited emails. Like she gets to send the unsolicited ones and then she gets the horrible replies and I never know anything about it. The glory of a middleman, right? Precisely. Yeah, no. People ask me questions and I just go, oh, I'll have to, you know, run it past the agent. I'm not going to, but it's a great excuse. (laughs) Um, So, yeah, I mean, it's for anyone starting. It's like, I think that's, It's the dream of anyone, like, you know, when they discover what they want to do with their lives. If you want to be a writer, you go, I've got to sell a script in America. I've got to make movies. And it's just like, no, like, make some shorts first. Like, don't worry about that. I'm happy that you you said that because that really has been uh, the the one thing in, in the back of everyone's mind, at least the people that I came up with when I was in theater, when I was in college, they were very much like, I've got a camera and an idea. Are you free on Saturday? Perfect. You get yeah. three or four people just to go shoot something. It will be terrible. Yeah. Do it six or seven times. It might be all right. And yeah, you know, th- it's, you know, you look at clerks and Kevin Smith bankrupted himself on credit cards yep. just to hide the equipment to make clerks. This thing shoots 4K and it's an iPhone. It's mm-hmm. like you could make clerks on your phone and start your career. It doesn't matter what you make it on. It's how fucking good it is. The black and that's white filter is just a button now. <laughs> yeah, that's all that matters. It doesn't matter how cheaply made, how crappy it is. If it's a great story and it's really, really well written, you can't say Clerks is well directed. It's really not. But it is an astonishingly written movie that's so funny. And well, I came in through Mallrats. Uh, I, I went back Mallrats. to Clerks, but I came into Mallrats and I would argue the same thing. It's in color, but yeah. it, it's got holes in it. But the yeah. story that it's telling, the characters that are in it are just like, I know a guy who does nothing. Well, back when malls were a thing, we don't really yes. have them much anymore. But yeah, yeah. Uh, do you do you have hope? I, I guess is is the, 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 the last major question I have for you is given the state of the world, where we're going geopolitically, economically, climate, yes. climately. I don't I'm a writer, whatever. Do you yeah. have hope for something in in the near term, the long term? What are your what's your five year plan? My five year plan. Wow. Um, I mean, not dying. That would be great. That's the top um, of mind. I'll give you that. Yeah. Number one on the list. Um, yeah. I mean, you know, the, the world is a horrible place right now, but it's like. I don't want to sound all, you know, hippy dippy, but it's like for. You know, everything that's bad in the world equates to like 10% of the world. The 90% of it is beautiful, but we only hear about the 10% that's crap. Yeah. And so, you know, it's down to all these, you know, I don't want to say old people in power, Um, uh, you know, not necessarily even America, but, you know, everywhere. It's just like, we just need like, my hope is, you know, the next generation, maybe it tra- you know the right, the trajectory right. changes but it's certainly not going to change in the short term listen i don't trust my grandmother to drive do i honestly think <laughs> i'm going to put her in power of a of a of a of a first world nation i, yeah. I don't want to put her on a city council i love the woman she yeah. you know she made great you know breakfast when i when i was a child but she's had her turn man like let's yeah 
it's like, you know, it's like when Obama became president and it was just like, and he, you know, he did a pretty good job. There are things that he did, didn't do particularly well, but you could all, there was always something about him that kind of went, he gets it. He's really trying, you know, mm. and it's like, now you've got people, I mean, you know, Biden, Trump, whatever. I I will refrain from critiquing either of them. Um, but yeah, it's just, they've had a go. It was, you know, Biden is certainly better than the alternative right now, maybe. And it's just like, the, you know. The jury is out, but I, I am hard yeah. I am hard pressed to say that you're wrong. But it's one of those things where I don't know too many 80, 81-year-old people who are like, yeah, they got a good five more years in them. Like, yeah. there's a certain yeah. question where I'm like, yeah, even even if we do come out the other side, yeah. Is he going to make it that long? I don't know. No, I don't know. Yeah, I mean, I just and Trump's look at it literally like, right behind him, and nobody talks about that. But whatever. Yeah, yeah Trump's seventy-seven. It's like or seventy-eight, seventy-seven. But yeah, it's like if we can just get through this period now, maybe ten years from now, you know, and my kid, my daughter is like almost thirty. Maybe the world might be a slightly better place for her then. I'm not hopeful, but I hope it is. Um, and yeah, so maybe like get rid of everything now. Look at ten years in the future. Hopefully, right. then the sun comes out again. And I, I saw it, that. Yeah, for, again for the benefit of those with flash photography, uh, I see the, uh, the the sunshine, and I think that for me is I'm going to take it as a sign. I think so. The universe is watching. They're going <laughs> to steal our script ideas and let other people do them first. But when we need yes. a moment of sunshine, it'll give it to us. There in, we go. In, in the last uh, you know couple minutes here. Oh. Uh, th- we just got done talking about what your five-year plan is for hope. Let's do the opposite of that. This is a segment I like to call pick a fight. What is uh, a thing about the industry, uh, either small, large, intermediate, whatever, that you want to see completely eradicated, dead, or you would want to fight it um, on the schoolyard and, and beat it down in front of its friends? Um, wow. Uh I mean, from a purely, I mean, it's not necessarily a selfish perspective, but for me, I just want to see, you know, A24 is doing amazing things. I just need another six of those companies that all do movies that good for low budgets. We need more of those. Oh, you, know, you would be both. Farm, you would be we both. Have, we can have the tempo movies. We can do all that. But A24 right now is like, you know, uh, I, I'm not going to say his name because he's a piece of shit. But that company in the nineties that made lots of really great movies, um, the indie movies. But yeah, uh, we just notable need... prick Harvey Weinstein. That's the one you <laughs> can say. It, I'm not. Um, yeah, so we need you know we need another six A twenty fours that are taking three, you know, five ten million mo- dollar movies that are really interesting, but doing them really really well. Like that trailer for Civil War just came out and it blew my mind. I was just like, yes. This is what we need. We need more stuff like this. And I get that sentiment a lot from the people that I talk to is the, you know, acting like there's something to be hopeful for. It's an A24 release, quite frankly. It's what weird bonkers ass project are they going to announce? And you're going to look at it being like, on its face, that seems completely weird. But it's an A24 film. I have to see it. Yeah, it's going to have merit. It's, it's, I don't know who runs it and I don't know who picks the scripts or anything, but whoever they are, pay them more money. Because right now, you watch a trailer, you know, you see a trailer on YouTube, you click it and it comes up A24 and instantly you, you lean in and you go, okay, this is going to be good. Like, you click the button to go full screen and be like, all right, I'm here. In the next yeah. two and a half minutes, I'm ready to go. Me two and a half weirds of utter weirdness. And by the time it ends, I'm going to go, I need to see this. And it's it's Love. they they did you know the Green Knight and I was like I've read that story a thousand times uh, growing up various King Arthur tales I'm sure you know where that story was invented you've probably read your fair share and I was like there's no possible way they're going to be able to do a unique spin on the Green Knight and then you're like oh no Dev Patel's an action star and now I want to see his Monkey Man film oh my god how good does that look it, yeah I I love the notion that a guy that and, and and this is absolutely no shade i mean this in the most possible positive possible way but a guy that doesn't look like he can kick your ass with the right no. lighting and camera cuts 
he can fuck you up, man. <laughs> the, 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 the part where he hits the dude in the face with the microwave door. Amazing. I don't even, yeah. I, yeah. And, you know, he. I mean, yeah, I saw the trailer and then it came up at the end, like directed by Deb Patel. And I was like, what? Holy crap. Like, I, that's the kind of thing I, I hope we get more of in the future is yeah. apparently he was told uh, that he needed to stay in his lane, kind of like what we've been talking about. No, nah, this is where this is. This is more your speed, that kind of thing. And he's like, no, but I really I really want to do an action film. And then I hate to keep referencing this because Thanos was supposed to be the bad guy. But the yeah. thing is, OK, I'll do it myself is the most inspiring thing of the last 15 years. And yeah. it, it, it came from a Marvel movie, so let's give them their flowers. But that thing is like, you know what? You know what? I'm just going to do it myself. Yeah. A and it's the only way to do it now. If you want to make waves, no one's going to give you $20 million to make a film. Go and make it and make it the best film you can possibly make for as much, you know, for as little money as you can possibly afford. And if it's a great movie, it will get attention. Because with the internet, if something goes viral, it goes everywhere very, very quickly. And the people who need to see it will see it at some point. The the global nature of things makes, you know, viral is not just a, you know, my friends saw it. It's, oh, no, the entire planet has seen this thing. Yeah. And, yeah. I, and I very much want it to do well. Yeah. I'm yeah. good. All right. On that note, then, uh, in, in the last couple of minutes here before uh, before we end, where can people find you? Where can people connect, reach out um, and, and get in touch with you across your your, your socials? Um, I, I use Twitter and I will continue to call it Twitter because it's not X. Um, you can it is find not. <laughs> no, you can find me on Twitter at David Lee Stokes because I set my Twitter up about 10 years ago when no one knew who I was. Um, so yeah, at David Lee Stokes, and that's about it, really. I don't really use Instagram or Facebook or anything, just Twitter. But yep, that's where I am. Good, I, I love it. Thank you very much for your time. Appreciate you being on Bolded Slugs. And uh, again, the sunlight is just coming from from behind you off the wall there. So I hope you have uh, a, a good, glorious rest of your afternoon. Thank you, sir. Thank you very much, sir. Cheers. Bolded Slugs, the podcast, would like to thank our partners at filmsnobbery.com for hosting our show. Today's music is Sublime by Ken Bashari from the Free Music Archive, licensed under Creative Commons. Bolded Slugs, the podcast, is a Dapper Duck Media production.